I had an Im immediate feeling that there was a dark, very dark film out there, a real new form of film noir. And sometimes it's very strange circumstances, historical, cultural circumstances point to, to doing that. Like in the late 40s, early 50s, you had the great Humphrey Bogart uh, dark movies. And in a way, when, when you look around, when you look at America at this time, in a way it felt right. Do the darkest possible film imaginable. I've never seen a film with uh, uh, excessive use of drugs. I do not see that many films. And I personally do not like the culture of drugs. So I'm someone who has no idea what the drugs do to you. So I always had to ask the writer and I had to ask some more competent people, how, um, what does it do to you? Yes, heroin slows you down, makes you sleepy. Cocaine uh, makes you very agitated. And, and so um, I, I had to, to be advised. <clears throat> but in a way, I don't really care that much. And uh, the, the landscape uh, is not a landscape of drugs. It's something else. It's a, I kept saying to Nicholas, uh, the real thing is not the drugs. It's not that the drugs make you bad. Yes, in a way, yes. But um, the very point for me is that there's also such a thing as a bliss of evil. <laughs> and we are shooting a scene uh, tonight uh, on our last uh, day of shooting where there is clearly this kind of bliss of being bad. He enjoys it tremendously, even puts on a very special suit. And I, I named it the opera suit. You are going out to an opera event, to an operatic event, played like an opera. In a way, uh, this very delirious fever dream uh, image is uh, something that comes from a demented mind, uh, something that comes from some, someone who is under drugs, under delusions, under strange deliriums, uh, that, that this, in a way, is the epicenter of the film. Now I don't care about uh, this kind of definition uh, who is good, who is bad. Uh, uh, actually, the, his real evil, his real bad behavior solves an almost unsolvable case. He gets a result. He, uh, brings, uh, he brings the murderers to justice, but he does it in, in very unusual ways. I think uh, from the outset it was clear that uh, we should collaborate on this film. And as far as I understand, uh, Nicholas would only sign his contract if I uh, signed up as director. So that, that was a very pleasant sort of, of uh, moment and I, I thought no matter what we are going to do, this is a wonderful opportunity to work with the best of the best. So, and it has been very, very rewarding and we have been very, very intense. It's, it's a, a mutual agitation of mind. And I think uh, the two of us were a very good match to do this. It eluded quite often uh, every bystander, everyone who was involved uh, in the film, including the cinematographer who was only at arm's length Sometimes he would not know exactly what was going on. And, and sometimes there were some moments where I, I was so surprised that, that I laughed out loud. I normally, I, sometimes I do it when I expect it and I, I gag myself with a, with a handkerchief and I, I become purple in my face and I hold on and I, I do not explode. Uh, but there was one incident where where it's in the sound and I ruined the sound because I laughed out loud into the, into the end of a scene, which we had to repeat because of me. No, Val Kilmer, do not underrate the man. Uh, of course, uh, 
he's unruly and he's joking around and goofs around, but the moment the slate is done, the moment I do the slate, he steps into frame and is exactly right there. I said to her uh, in our only meeting that we had before the shooting, I said to her, because she was kind of nervous and didn't know how to handle the situation, and, and I said to her, uh, I will take you where you have not been before. And asked her, do you have the courage to step into that? And she said, yes, and that was the deal. And I said, I'm the one who waves his right to a trailer. I waive my right to a personal assistant. I waive my right to have a, a, a driver. I waive my right even to a chair. I don't even have a chair. So reduce. And she said, ah, oh, yeah, it's my agents and it's my business manager and it's my attorney and I, who, who want the star treatment for me uh, embedded in the language of the contract. And I said to her right away, point blank, you're not going to be a star in my movie. You will be royalty, like every single actor and every single, including every single actor is royalty. Whoever steps in front of my camera, no matter what he, she or it does, including the dog and including the iguana, are royalty. And that's how you will be treated. I want to set the cultural climate of uh, what we are doing and I always said we'll work like surgeons. There will be never any loud word on my set. There's work in whispers completely and utterly focused, like in open heart surgery. And uh, it, it is strange, but for me not a coincidence that this focus, this absolute focus and absolute concentration and professionality translates into the quality of the film. It's very mysterious, but it does. When I first read the uh, screenplay, I had the feeling this is a comedy. And in a way it is. You will see there will be a lot of laughter, but it's a, it will be a strange laughter. It will be something where you uh, do not enjoy it like a joke and you laugh out uh, loud. It's probably a, a very, very bleak, very dark humor. Um, and I'm sure that audiences will, will sense it. I remember we had uh, a rainstorm and I, I asked everyone in, in a van, uh, and that was Exhibit, two of his henchmen, and Nicholas, I said, uh, shall we get you umbrellas and get you into safety? No, they said, we are going to stay in this, in this van, it's all dry and so. And I, I looked through this torrential rain and I saw the, the van shaking and I thought, what, what is going on there? And then I realized they were joking and laughing. They laughed so hard that the whole van kept shaking. So I knew this was good. Let's wait until the rain is over. And then we are, the moment the rain is over, the last drop falls and, and we start filming and they are dead serious and they are completely in the scene. Sometimes I shot scenes uh, first take without rehearsal and, and then we, we, we immediately see the mistakes and I immediately start to eliminate second, third take are still somehow um, full of mistakes but then all of a sudden the third, fourth take is very, very good and I normally do not shoot more than let's say five, six times. If after, let's say, six times repeating a scene, a scene doesn't have any rhythm, a scene doesn't have any, anything forceful, anything that jumps at you as a spectator, then there's something wrong with a scene, either with a dialogue or with the acting or with how I direct it or with God knows, and I immediately start to rearrange things.
I like to do the slate myself. I'm always the last one to move out between the camera and the technical apparatus and the actors on the other side. And I, I can tell sometimes I would uh, have the sound rolling and I would sense uh, Nicholas is not completely there and he's still working himself into it. And I, I would just look at him because he would be that close to me. And I would now wait, 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 wait. And I see him and I nod at him and he nods imperceptibly. And then I do the slate and I move out. So it's never anything mechanical that I'm doing when I do the slate. It's not naturalistic uh, because I do very stylized films. Uh, now it's not naturalistic, but it's, a, it's an attitude of work. Uh, an actor must not try to find uh, the light here and there because it's half hidden. And in, in very, very few instances when we have extremely narrow sets, yes, there's no other alternative because we uh, do not have much options how to hide a, a reflector. So sometimes, yes, and I say, just if you shift your weight from one leg to the other, your, your face will move that far and you catch a light. So sometimes it's technical, but normally the, the light has to find the, the actor and the camera has to find the actor. Images in, in cinema have to try to at least uh, capture the status quo of our civilization and much of what we see is limping behind and I find it uh, very disquieting it's a very disturbing thing to see this because uh, evolution of culture and evolution of technology um, and many other fields is going at such a break uh, breakneck uh, pace, it's, it's head over heels, and we do not really catch up culturally. And in a way, I think movies should do that or should try that and create some, some deeper insights that are a little bit beyond what we normally see on television, for example. New Orleans has something specific and that is uh, recently, the hurricane that devastated uh, not only parts of the city, it devastated uh, social structures, it devastated families, it devastated uh, um, a code of uh, moral behavior. Uh, not for, for everyone, but uh, there was a decay of, of structures of civilization beyond the destructions that were done by the floodwaters and the storm itself. So, um, in a way, there's something looming from that, from that feeling into New Orleans today when, when you walk through the streets and when you talk to people, you, you still sense that. And it's an interesting, an interesting place that is broken open into a very raw state. I couldn't even distinguish who was New Orleans and who was from Los Angeles. Or we have Austrians in the crew, we have a German in the crew, me. Um, well, I can only say very competent people, uh, very, very motivated. They really want to show we are as good as anyone else in the world, and they are as good. And they are much more motivated than crews in, in Los Angeles, for example. Films do not create a family. Films create very, very short-lived, fleeting alliances. But you have to forge the alliance into something very, very significant.